streaming online our website. A little disclaimer there. Um, we're here to listen to your comments about the possibility of adding uh, new conditions. Um, those conditions are PTSD, depression, migraines, and generalized anxiety disorder. This is a public comment meeting. We listen to your comments and concerns about these four conditions. Um, we're not here to get into too much discussion. We may have some questions to clarify your concerns. Um, and we want to listen to the comments specifically on the four conditions today. So no new conditions, please. When giving oral comments, please limit your comments to those conditions. Um, provide us with scientific-based evidence, um, availability of conventional medical treatments uh, that can provide some kind of benefit, uh, as well as description of the symptoms and other physiological effects experienced that may impair the ability to accomplish activities of daily living. Um, we're here to do PTSD, take comments on it from 1 till 2.30. Um, at 2.30, we will uh, listen uh, on, for comments on the other three uh, possible uh, debilitating conditions. Um, when speaking, please do not hesitate to express support or opposition on previous comments, um, but tr please try to avoid repetition. Um, we may have questions, like I said, to clarify um, comments that you may have. They'll probably come from the back over here. And also, please refrain from clapping or cheering during this meeting. Um, we're trying to make this uh, as good as possible, and we don't want too much uh, other noise out there. Like that, yeah. Um, <laughs> if you wish to provide oral comments today, there's speaker slips um, right outside this door. Please fill it out, and we're going to take them in order. Um, I'm going to sit back here and call your oh, work, and uh, call your name to come up to speak. We were going to limit it to two minutes. Um, but we can probably limit it to five, so um, please use that time wisely. And if you don't get to speak or if you have additional comments um, throughout the day or throughout the weekend, we're going to leave our online uh, comment form open. So it's going to close today at five. So if you're left out or have additional thoughts of the weekend, um, please feel free to use that as well. Um, any questions throughout the session of the meeting? Which microphone? This one right here, the hardwired one. When will we know if the uh uh, middle, end of July. Okay. Yes. We have a group of speakers, and we have an order we'd like to present them in. Could we call our name? Could we just pass and go to the next? Yeah, group? we're going to do a first come, first serve basis. Um, and I have the stack over here. So as long as this time, everyone can get through. Okay? I'll call the first name now. We'll get the meeting, meeting moving. before you start, Jill, I apologize. Um, we have a timer up here. Um, let's, I'll show you in five minutes, so please encourage the others, and I'll tell you when five minutes is up. Could you, could you say the full name, please? You just said Gerald. Um, Gerald S. Kessler. Yeah, you can't read the handwriting. Just like it sounds, one F, no T's, C-H-E-S-L-E-R. Thank you. And I am an attorney in this industry, and with the group that is petitioning today, and unfortunately it looks like we're going to go out of order, but my stuff uh, can fit in anywhere. I'm an attorney and understand that this is going to be a scientific evaluation and I think that's a good thing the science that should be left to the doctors and the scientists but um, we're talking about post-traumatic stress disorder and that is a population of people who have seen or lived through horrible events that continue to be haunted by them to the, to the point that it affects their life um, a large segment of this group is veterans and uh, I don't care if it was the guy who stormed the beaches in Normandy, and I'm old enough, I used to work with those guys, um, or the guys who were in those hellish jungles in Vietnam, or the guys in the desert in Iraq, or the people in, uh, in the mountains in Afghanistan. They are all seeing and living through horrible things, and, uh, they, and therefore veterans create, create a big portion of the population of PTSD patients. Um, and these people, the veterans in particular, have been suffering these consequences and living through these horrible events to protect us. So I think if there is something we can do to help these people, we should be doing it. Uh, even if there's something we think might help these people, we should be doing it. Um, you'll hear scientific support for what's going on, but from the layman's point of view, uh, medical marijuana makes sense for, for uh, PTSD. 
these are people who can't let go of these horrible experiences they've had. And the toxicity that they talk about with marijuana, these terrible side effects, tend to be memory loss. Well, that's awfully good if you can't let go of the horrible experiences you've had. They tend to be uh, apathy. And these are people who are caring a little too much. And then it tends to be euphoria, this false sense of uh, things being uh, well-being. And these are people who are having a false sense of problems. It's good a little false well-being might be good for these people. So when you look at the science, I hope you'll apply a little common sense to it as well. <laughs> but we try to do the right thing. We try to help. And somehow life has unintended consequences. And if we take the veteran who's been self-medicating by buying pot illegally, and he's perfectly happy and his life is good, we turn around we legalize him, and he loses his VA benefits, we haven't really done this guy a favor. So I wanted to direct you, and I put it on my speaker, <coughs> the VHA Directive 2011-004, uh, uh, because in uh, January of 2011, the VA has actually dealt with this. And they do have a policy on medical marijuana, um, not specifically relating to PTSD, but they do have a policy. And of course, they're in the difficult position of needing to support veterans, but also they're a federal organization, they're governed by federal law, and they have to deal with the Controlled Substance Act. They have therefore determined that use of medical marijuana in a state that allows it will not cause somebody to be administra administratively discharged from their program. They can participate in substance abu abuse programs, in chronic pain programs. Um, without losing their benefits because of the use of medical marijuana. And I just think that's important. It's something the state needs to know. It's something we need to understand when we're dealing with this. Now, because of the uh, Controlled Substances Act, they do have some limitations, and their doctors will not fill out a, a, uh, a, certification, a certification form. Their pharmacist will not fill a prescription for it. And in fact, it's still illegal, and, and any veteran will be subject to arrest for carrying marijuana, medical or otherwise, on VA property. But when it comes down to it, the VA will list medical marijuana as a medication not projected, not um, uh, prescribed by the VA as a non-VA medication, and it will not describe, it will not disqualify the patient. So I'm urging you to take a look at the VHA Directive 2011-004, uh, um, and I'm um, urging you to, if you think there is even a slight possibility that um, medical marijuana would help people with uh, PTSD. And like I said, to me it makes sense, I think it would. Um, if there's even a slight possibility, we should make it available to veterans, to the people who suffered these injuries and are suffering these, uh, the, these conditions in their efforts to help us and protect us. That's all I got. Do you have a copy of that directive? Yeah, mine's all scribbled on. I can send you one or I'll give you my scribbled on one if, uh, that, uh, if that's okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, next is uh, Daryl Butch Williams. I uh, <coughs> gotta clear my throat, and I'm not as tall as So, <laughs> First off, it's a it's an honor to be here, and this is a it's a glorious moment for all of us that. Uh, are suffering from one of these elements that uh, cannabis can help us with. Um, now, um, I am actually a, a patient and a patient of post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, PTSD. And uh, <clears throat> before uh, medical marijuana became part of my life, uh, I actually thought that everybody knew, or all the science was out there about uh, cannabis. In fact, um, medical marijuana, the THC molecule wasn't discovered until uh, 1964 by a chemist in Jerusalem, uh, Ralph uh, McEwen, uh, Raphael. And um, it was in 1988 when Alan Hallett also discovered uh, receptors for this actual molecule. Um, these receptors were found in the brain, um, the hippocampus, which uh, controls the memory. Um, it also is in the cerebellum, which controls movement. Um, the frontal cortex, which is also helps control your thinking. Okay, and if, you, if any of you understand what uh, the receptor means, for a receptor to have to happen, it has to fit like a key. And this molecule just so happens to fit just like a key. Um, short, short after the discovery of this cannabinoid receptor, the endocannabinoid system and whatnot, 
they also were discovered that the body actually creates a synthetic version of THC, which is um, also discovered by Ralph, if you know Raphael. It's called atomide. Uh, that's what he called it. Atomide is a synthetic uh, that our body is trying to produce, and what it does is it actually will help us to forget. This is a huge role in our brains. Um, our brains are uh, set to for memory, and that memory is to help us to uh, survive, help us to remember where we need to go, or help us remember phone numbers. Um, but forgetting is also a giant portion of us. Um, we get in contact with uh, many, many people throughout the day, and we, should, we, we our brains would be just stored with information about every conversation we've had with each one of these faces that we see. Uh, so forgetting is also just as important as remembering. As we remember, we also, I mean, as we forget, we also need to remember what types of things we need to get out of our brains. And this molecule that we produce synthetically is the exact same properties as the THC molecule. This THC molecule, with it in our hands to be able to use in science, can help us understand how the atomite uh, receptors can help us in forgetting and being able to use these in specific times of trauma. In my life, I, um, it's been awful, the anxiety, the nightmares, and things that come from remembering these experiences from your, uh, from your trauma that, you, that you've had. To me, this receptor, this cannabinoid receptor that we have in our bodies would help us and allow us to be able to properly think about what happened, slow our brains down enough to forget about what happened, and properly move forward within our lives, and balance this, and balance ourselves. And that's exactly what this, this wonderful miracle drug, marijuana, can do for us. So I hope that you can take it, the information that you're gonna hear today, and take, uh, take it from patients like myself who truly, truly um, believe that this medicine has helped save their lives. Thank you. Repeat you your name real quick. Yeah. Uh, Butch Williams. Butch, one question for you. Uh, do you have any uh, supplemental documentation of that which you presented? Um, do you have a box over here in the floor? Please submit it in there or submit it online. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, next up is James Bacon. I'm taller than both Jerry and Bush. Here's this thing out here. Go back for the first thing. Don't let me find it. My name is James Bacon. Um, I'd like to thank Jerry and Butch that went ahead of me for providing that information. Um, I'm a, a single father um, who's also a patient and had, that has a family member, a, a stepsister who has recently been diagnosed with uh, PTSD. Um, I want to share a little bit about um, her journey and the effect as a family member and I'm also an advocate and um, the effects that it's had on her and our family. Uh, my sister's journey started uh, when she was a toddler living in uh, Bakersfield, California. And um, as a toddler, she was driving in the car with her mother and father, and out of nowhere, they had a, uh, an accident, a rollover, in which um, both her mother and father uh, passed away. So as a toddler, she witnessed that. Um, later on in life, um, she moved and she became adopted and moved to San Diego, California. And things seemed to be going really well. But uh, when she turned 21 years old, she, uh, was invited, to, uh, her and her two older sons were invited to a wedding reception, and at the wedding reception, uh, they were leaving and they were walking out to the car, and um, senseless violence occurred, um, it was a couple gunshots, she got shot in her ankle, and her two sons witnessed, witnessed this, okay? And so, um, <clears throat> over the years, uh, since then, she's moved to Arizona, and she's overcome some challenges, but one of the things is being her brother I've dealt with over the years is listening to her talk about her flashbacks, um, the inability to get out and about, 
and leave, live a more productive life. And so, obviously, as an advocate, I'm always trying to help her and point her in the right direction to get help. And um, right now, this seems to be medical marijuana seems to be a really good um, uh, option. And so, we're just looking forward to that. Um, but the main thing I just wanted to share with you is that uh, it does affect other family members. Uh, and so as an advocate, obviously for my kids that I raised, I also want to reach out to my sister and help and point her in the right direction. So I just wanted to share that with you. And in my background, having traveled around the world playing basketball, um, this is huge and this is another opportunity for people to have a choice to choose uh, and with the medical field on the types of medications outside of uh, opiates and things as such, okay? So I just want to share that with you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, James. Uh, next up is Dr. Alan J. Harrison. Are we good? Can you hear me? I'm a, I'm a retired physician, uh, practice over 20 years. And uh, I'm also a medical marijuana patient. You can probably hear this, hear that crackling noise. Actually, we use stereo. Uh, I was a chiropractor, seeing over 100 patients a day. I have a birth defect called agenesis of interosseous ligaments. That means the little ligaments that tie all the bones together. I never got them. And uh, so I've had that my whole life. And one day about seven years ago, I couldn't pick up a glass of water and it was like a big sword went up my arm came out the other side and uh, as a result of medical marijuana i have uh, i have function uh, life is happy and this this year uh, documented probably better than anything else pretty exciting uh, i went and got my recertification just yesterday and from uh, ingesting cannabis uh, a very tiny amount every day uh, for the last seven months uh, since my last certification exam I've lost 37 pounds so uh, we're, it's pretty exciting uh, that you can the old stigma of having the munchies from uh, e eating cannabis uh, pretty ridiculous uh, another one of those uh, false images that were put there the purpose that, uh, that I wanted to come up and talk about was uh, we we're, we're blessed we, we have a progressive thinking state we've got this proposition 203 and we're now dealing today with the questions of PTSD and migraines. Well, the really good news that we just had this tremendous symposium that I'm glad to say Will Humble even participated and was there at, at the program in Tucson. This research is already out there. The scientific information is there. We're also blessed with having a physician here in the area that is certified in cannabinoids. Personally, I think every doc that's writing a recommendation should have to be certified in cannabinoids to know what and why. Now that also presents a very double-edged sword, and this was the point that I wanted to talk about, because it, that doctor-patient relationship is a critical thing. When you are certified in cannabinoids, you are also abreast of all the current literature that's out there, and there is a lot. I can spend two hours a day going through current research that's done by scientists all over the world that's undisputable. The thing is, when you look at that information and you're a physician, and you know that there's this little tiny list of conditions in the thousands of conditions that exist, but you know that current research actually looks at maybe into hundreds of conditions that are responding incredibly favorably. Now for a physician to say, I recommend X, y, uh, cannabis for X, Y, Z condition because research is now showing that it responds favorably, well, there's now a, a, a a group or governing body that says, oh no, no, only these conditions right over here. That's a huge problem, okay, for two reasons. One, it puts the, posi the physician in a position of liability because they actually know of stuff that's working for a patient, and two, this shouldn't even be coming up. It shouldn't be a, a question because not one person on record ever has ever died of cannabis. Here, if someone, God forbid, is, comes down with, say, a cancer or this or that, and they're willing to take these drugs that they know there's a high liability that they're died from that treatment and they're willing to take it here nobody has ever died of cannabis it's very safe they may go to sleep and that's about it most of the people that i help with this i'm also a caregiver are over 70 years old they sh this should never be an issue if a doctor says i think you would you would benefit it shouldn't come up it's a doctor patient relationship thing 
the fact that it's it's going over in these other things where other people are making rules and regulations as if the doctor says it's good, what's the problem? I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Brown. Just a reminder, guys, we're here to discuss PTSD, so stick with the discussion of PTSD at this time. And once again, provide this documentation online or to the box out the door. Uh, next up is Bill Francis. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bill Manstis, M-A-N-S-T-I-S, um, Criminally Disabled Veteran. Um, in line of duty injuries, I have an unrepairable shoulder. I've survived brain surgery. I'm about to have S5L1 spinal fusion surgery. Uh, medicine doesn't work. All it does is leave me sick on the floor, puking, sweating. It's absolutely repulsive. Medical marijuana is the only thing that helps me. I have a formal diagnosis of extreme post-traumatic stress disorder in two different forms. Mine, I hate to admit this to everyone, but I was suffered a military sexual trauma at the hands of medical personnel. My progress notes, which I shared with Catherine and I a little, little bit earlier, my uh, Therapist clearly states in, in my assessment that the veteran continues to show bright effect with less irritability and working more proactively. In good spirits with increased optimism, no psychotropic medications are needed. Deny suicidal idolation. In my diagnosis, it clearly states post-traumatic stress disorder from military sexual trauma, depressive disorder, anxiety disorder, and cannabis use allowed medicinal for back pain per my report. The truth is right here, ladies and gentlemen. I want to thank Butch Williams for coming to town. He's a uh, recognized expert in, in the industry. I'm very thankful that people like that have actually come here to Arizona to help the patients of Arizona. I want to bring something to everyone's attention that happened at the Patients Out of Time conference in Tucson on April 28th. Uh, this information was shared with me by a uh, source that wished not to be identified that's in research at the Phoenix VA Hospital. This is a report on medical cannabis as a treatment for chronic PTSD, promising results in an open pilot study. Anyone that would like to receive this report from me, please see me afterwards. Thank you for your time. Uh, next up is Jerry Young. so hard I had my eye completely knocked out of the socket. Uh, my eyebrow hanging from my earlobe. Um, I had several head traumas after that in recovery on their drugs. I was on uh, uh, Dilantin and all kinds of medication. And I was self-medicating at the time. Uh, you know, non era people that did it all the time anyway. And the doctors told me that it was allowing blood to not coagulate in that right eye, saving it. So they put me in a ward. They were uh, kind of experimenting with uh, burn survivors and other kinds of conditions. They were kind of allowed permission back then to kind of go off base, medicate, and come back. But uh, what I'm concerned about is a lot of veterans don't melt down from right away. I didn't. I had a first tour from 71 when I was drafted, got out, re-enlisted to be a helicopter mechanic, and I saw some terrible things. Um, I didn't start melting down until I came home. And that's when I had a lot of brain trauma. Uh, I went over a cliff with a car, suffering with seizures from the trauma of a steel pipe and another pipe. Uh, fights, jail, you name it, I've been through it. And uh, my wife, out of, uh, I met her in a vet's home uh, 35 years ago. Um, she, her mother was a cook there. I was put in a, I guess you might say, uh, in, a, in a home. 
Uh, I was disabled very bad. I didn't have a driver's license. And so uh, she drove me around when she fell in love with She can tell you, for almost 30 years, uh, medicating on this instead of the other drugs. I can get up here and do this today because I need to sit here and I, I, I don't even like to come in the room for a lot of people. I need to be recluse. Um, I'm healthy enough. I do some work at home out of my house, but I'm not. I don't play well with others because I've had a lot of mental issues and uh, memory problems. I'm dyslexic. I switch numbers around. Uh, the marijuana kind of. Uh, I don't know, mellows me out, and I, my folks have documentation proof of everything that's happened to me. I've had I had three head traumas in one year that should have killed me, and um, I would still be medicated. My kidneys would probably be gone by now, but I'm pretty healthy. I can get to the floor and back up without even using my hands now. I have uh, L4, L5 blown, uh, atlas and radius in my neck. It was pinched off and actually touching my brain stem at one time. I couldn't breathe, so I was on a cane and a walker, and you wouldn't know it now. But I go to swim class, I exercise. This stuff motivates me to, uh, you know, I sleep well. That's the problem, I sleep well. That's, that's, I don't know if that's why, but sometimes they melt down later. They'll come back, you won't notice anything at first. Give them a few months of being out in society again. These guys are gonna melt down. And that's when we really need to have uh, something for PTSD. Because the drugs they had me on uh, fired me worse. I had no fear. The drugs they had, had me on, I had uh, no fear of death. I mean, I drive cars. 100 miles an hour and 40 miles, it didn't matter. I wasn't afraid to die. Uh, this stuff brings me to reality. And so now I respect life, I'm different. I don't break the laws now because I'm finally a card holder. Um, I just hope uh, this can help future veterans with whatever I say. But uh, uh, that's about all I have to say for now. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Beth. <coughs> uh, next up is Leo Haggerty. Hi, my name is Leo Haggerty. Uh, I'm a combat veteran. I was 101st in uh, June 1969, Ashdown Valley. My first uh, fell a company, 2nd 327. Uh, when I got to the helicopter, they got me to where my unit was. I, uh, within 24 hours, I was in my first firefight. In the next four months, I was in six firefights. I was 19 years old. Uh, I thought I'd be a sprinter. Uh, I was the fastest. Probably the fastest 18 year old in the city of Buffalo back in 1967. I always thought I'd go to the Olympic Games. Never smoked a cigarette in my life. Didn't want anything to do with that. However, I found myself uh, on base camp smoking marijuana. And I found out after, you know, we ambushed six people. And uh, it's not just uh, uh, doing the ambushing, it's cleaning it up after it and everything like that. And during three, four months of that, uh, there's a lot of process to it. And uh, if you see, uh, if you go on Facebook or YouTube and you see uh, Oliver Stone, Bill Maher, drugs, you'll see where Oliver Stone was a combat veteran who was in the infantry. He says that, uh, and I, of course I saw this maybe in 2010 on Facebook, but I'm just, uh, in retro, I'm just saying that uh, he said that the combat veterans, that when they got back to the fire base that uh, used marijuana were the ones that, there was a vetting process, there was a process there. I didn't know what was going on. I couldn't uh, give you what was going on then, but it helped me, and I continued to smoke. When I came back to Vietnam, it was illegal. I heard that your chromosomes had died when you had kids. I have a son that's in the Navy, he's 38 years old. That was a lie. Uh, I was given Valium by the VA hospital in the 80s. Uh, I was an alcoholic because I was self-medicating with alcohol then at the time too. Of course, we didn't see any front page news on USA Today about Valium's alcohol base, the suicide rates for Vietnam veterans are sky high because they're alcoholics. And there was nothing, to, did the pharmaceutical industry, did they come clean? No, they didn't, okay, it was just, sorry, never mind. We're not gonna give the, this large portion of people Valium anymore. Anyways, PTSD. Uh, I was diagnosed with PTSD in the early 80s. I didn't know what it was. Dr. Clyde Bauer says you have PTSD, you don't have to go back to work. So I just got this job. Uh, but I, uh, I've always continued to uh, self-medicate with alcohol and marijuana. I didn't know, I wasn't a doctor, I knew I was feeling better with marijuana, it helped me. Uh, I have a sleep disorder. I was told that uh, if I fall asleep in combat, they slit my throat, these are my own guys. I understood what they were talking about. When I came back, I had trouble sleeping, went down to Vietnam Vet Center, and uh, <laughs> I still to this day, I go, I go to sleep four or five in the morning. I, I, I work for the railroad night shift. My counselor's telling me to get a night job. I work for the, rail, uh, for the post office. 
I, I, uh, I work midnight shift. Medical marijuana is very important to me. Uh, I, I, I'm out in Phoenix a year now, and uh, uh, four or five months I, re I realized that I can apply it for it. Got my license legal. I comply with everything. It helps me on a daily basis. It's very important. It's very important that uh, this passes because there's a lot of veterans that need this. I need this, and I want to thank you, and I want to thank all the people here for all their good works here. This is good works to do this. Thank you so much. Thank you, Leo. Uh, next up is Arizona Mike. Thank you, Mr. Ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to introduce myself. My name is Arizona Mark Henry Milky, not Mike. I am an alcoholic. I'm a, I am an ascended master. I'm an incarnation of the Archangel Michael. I have been here many times. I am who I am. In my last life on this planet, I was a bodhisattva known as psychiatrist Carl Young. Skip that part. Western man seems to be the only creature, culture, that has a problem with the natural and indigenous herb, even in the areas that he conquers, steals, and rapes. The Brits in this, the Brits did this in India, as well as the Italians and Spaniards here. The new miracle drug is what many professionals have dubbed the herb. It would be hard pressed to find a person in this state that has more reason to have the debilitating and at time and dysfunct and ailments that are being discussed here today. My PTS began here in 1988 while incarcerated for DUI in the most cu minimum custody prison. My firstborn child was ripped away from me and taken out of state illegally. This is what took place a year and a half later. On December 2nd of 1989, after two failed attempts to murder Christopher and his father Mark and make it appear to be a murder-suicide, three perpetrators led Christopher into a remote desert wash west of Phoenix, Arizona. Christopher was shot in, in the back of the head three times and left in the desert. Perpetrators had discussed the plane in front of Christopher and feared that he would tell his father. Three perpetrators were arrested the day after Christopher was murdered. All three of them were charged on first degree murder, conspiracy to commit murder, kidnapping, and child abuse. They were all convicted and sentenced to the death penalty. One of the murderer, one of the murderers was Christopher's mother. For twenty years have I have I counseled, therapeutized, inspired people in grief and in trauma. In my inspirational speaks, as, as well as my voluminous writings, I refer to life with PTSD as making love to a gorilla. You ain't done till the gorilla's done. There have been a few times over the past 20 years that I have self-experimented with the spiritual medicinal drug marijuana to cut the edge off the bite of this recovering monster, of this reoccurring monster, totaling these to about two to three years use out of my 23. The advantage of medical or spiritual use of marijuana allows the disorder or disease to slowly regain some semblance of order and ease while working through certain stages of the grief process or various therapies. It is possible for certain types or archetypes of individuals to regain a peaceful, harmonious life without deteriorating their minds and bodies through the unnatural methods and chemicals that tear down or destroy the human body. Introduction to foreign chemicals changed the individual's biochemistry and immune system to a state of dependence or weakness and oftentimes destruction. 
over a brief or, or lengthy period of time, today's modern science, medicine, and technology are actually still in their infancy compared to 6,000 years of Eastern philosophy and healing. Our new and improved culture could learn much by cohabitating with these elder forms of healing and evolving rather than destroying and dissolving. My most recent writings, writing venture in this second draft form was written over the course of uh, one month during four three-day weekends during a seven in the midst of a 17-credit semester community college year. Just let me give me the five minutes is up. Okay. Uh, if you want to submit the papers you still have to the box back here, sure. or feel free to submit them over the weekend as well. Okay. We'll read them. Thank you. Uh, next up uh, is Ingrid Doya. Services. We've done a phenomenal job 
it's a very, very serious obstacle that many of the public know and many of us don't know. But I think they've done a phenomenal job to bring this to the forefront. But we're almost there, and we've got to cross the goal line. We have to assess that this cannabis can help patients uh, that are suffering from mental health issues. And I think it's our job and our duty and our responsibility to make sure that we provide that for them. And so with that, I'm going to give you another minute and kick it to you. My name is Kendrick Speak. I'm the Chief Development Officer for Compassion First. We're a uh, service provider to the industry. I'll keep this very, very short and, and simple. Um, there appears to be a surfeit of, of anecdotal uh, data, stories from patients and physicians and caregivers that clearly indicate cannabis is a very effective way to treat the symptoms of PTSD. Um, there is not, however, a surfeit of quantitative um, data that um, uh, indicates the same thing, um, but we're getting there. Two of the uh, two of the research uh, papers that we submitted in our petition, uh, one from Dr. George Greer in New Mexico, and another one from uh, Drs. Uh, Moti Mordecai and and uh, Yehuda Barush from Israel, um, are studies looking at uh, the use of cannabis in combat veterans with PTSD. And uh, both of those studies are, um, are just a few months shy of undergoing peer review. And I, and I clearly understand that, that peer review is one of the requirements. Um, I, would, I would like to see the following, I think many of us would, um, that due consideration be given to uh, the qualitative data that supports uh, cannabis as a, as a treatment for PTSD symptoms. Um, uh, as much consideration given to the qualitative information as, as is given to the to the quantitative uh, information. So that's all I have to say. Thanks for everyone listening. Thank you. Uh, next up is Kendrick. No, that was him. No, sorry. Doug B. of working with the medical marijuana patient community over the last year and I'm also just recently in April of this last year became the uh, first physician certified cannabis certified physician in the state of Arizona and a diplomat at the American Academy of Cannabinoid Medicine so I take this very seriously I'm very passionate about it I understand that I'm on the bleeding edge but that's where I want to advocate for the patients because I truly believe in this medicine um, I also was at the conference in Tucson in April and had an opportunity to see the breadth of studies and uh, the scientists that are working on the uh, cannabinoid system. They're studying uh, the cannabis plant as it uh, uh, pertains to uh, reduction of brain tumors, breast, tum breast tumors. There's uh, PhDs that are working in Spain, Israel that Kendrick spoke of. They're doing a lot of studies with um, PTSD. And I had an opportunity to speak to the, um, the doctor of, from Israel and I'm um, thoroughly convinced as a result of speaking with him and reading his studies, the benefits that uh, cannabis will have, does have for um, PTSD. Unfortunately, in the past year, I haven't had an opportunity, I've worked with a handful of PTSD patients, but of course, not a lot simply because it's not a qualifying condition. The opportunity I have had is because they had a co-condition that was on the qualifying list. And in those cases, when they came back, they were coming back for renewals now, and then talking with them in six month intervals, seeing the great benefits that they're, they're, they're having with a reduction of their medication that, that uh, typically has a lot of harm associated with it and, ten, and versus um, the, uh, and the decrease in their symptoms. Uh, one patient in particular had uh, night terrors on a regular basis and now in the past year since using cannabis is getting um, a, a good quality sleep, which is very important to overall health in general, and then as a result of that, reduces his anxiety and depression just as a result of doing that. 
I also had an opportunity when I was in Tucson to meet Brian Crump. Um, I hope I see accent. I <laughs> pronounce his name correctly. He's a um, psychiatric nurse practitioner in the state of New Mexico. And not only is Israel conducting studies and using um, cannabis for PTSD, New Mexico is the only state in the, uh, of the 16 states that are using medical marijuana to have PTSD as a qualifying condition, and that was in 2007. So I thought I would go to our neighboring states and talk to him about how it's been working there. And he so kindly gave me a paper that he has written, and I'll be happy to leave here um, for the hearing, that uh, he hopes to get published soon. And what he's seeing in the results of working, his, his predominant um, population is PTSD patients, and he's seeing an extreme improvement with the symptom relief as well as a decrease, if not an elimination of medication uh, without negative side effects. And that's the one thing I wanted to draw attention to is we're concerned about side effects. And of course, as a clinician, a physician, and uh, we are concerned with science, evidence-based medicine. I'm also concerned with what's going to be efficient and safe for our patients. And one of the things with cannabis as the side effects um, expand, span all the way from basic, you know, red eyes to that, uh, what they call couch lock, which is extreme fatigue, to at the higher end, the, at the worst case scenario, could be an increase in anxiety and uh, paranoia. That would be the extreme. There isn't any um, uh, side effect of the use of cannabis with narcotic medications as there might be with alcohol. It's a lot of PTSD patients are alcoholics because they're trying to self-medicate. And what can happen is they can depress their respiratory or cardiovascular system, and then that obviously is extremely not a good um, outcome. Cannabis does not do that. There are no uh, no receptors in the brainstem that controls res respiration and um, uh, our cardiovascular or heart. So um, the main concern then would be anxiety and paranoia. However, that is very strain and mal and molecule specific. And when I say molecule specific, cannabis has several molecules that have been identified. THC is one of the more common ones known, but there's another one called cannabidiol. And the uh, strains that can potentiate anxiety would be a more stimulating strain such as a sativa. So I think for safety and efficacy for our patients, it's important that, and I'm very glad to see that the state has um, made it mandatory to have a medical director for the dispensaries. And not only that, it, um, uh, Ingrid alluded to the fact that we should test the medication. So as a physician recommending uh, cannabis or as a medical director, they should be knowledgeable about what strain the patient's getting and the levels of THC and CBD. And for future discussion, not for now, I really do encourage that, pay, that physicians that are working with certifications of marijuana. Thank you. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, next up, Corey. My name is Corey Tishka, and I am here to speak as the wife of a combat veteran. My husband serves 10 years in the Air Force as a helicopter gunner. He worked in special operations, and he fought in multiple conflicts, Bosnia, Iraq, Iran. Uh, he was in Korea, Cuba, Panama. He was all over the place, and his job was he was strapped to a 50 cal minigun, and his job was to blow things up. 15 years later, he still sees and smells death. His dreams are horrible. When he was fighting to keep his children and he was drug testing, he was not able to use marijuana. During that time, he was prescribed antidepressants, sleeping pills, and narcotic painkillers. All these did were make things worse. He was a zombie, he was irritable, and at night I could see the dreams coming on. It would start with this, and I'm sorry, this is very personal, but it would start with this rapid breathing, very patterned and fast. Um, and he would start shaking and sweating and wake up in tears. When medical cannabis was legalized in Arizona and he was able to qualify under chronic pain and start using the medical marijuana again, he now can sleep through the night. If he wakes up, previously if he woke up from a dream and he would try to go back to sleep, he would be right back in it within a minute. 
And now, if he wakes up in the middle of the night, it doesn't happen every night. And when he does, he can go outside, smoke his cannabis, and come back to bed. Being able to get a whole night's sleep and not to have to see that all the time and to relive it every single day makes him able to function during the day as well. He's, he can do things now. He's, he doesn't get frustrated at the smallest things. So I know that you're looking for scientific evidence and as Kendrick said, qualitative evidence is scientific and I hope that you see the overwhelming evidence that supports cannabis as an effective treatment for PTSD. Thank you. Doug? That'll work, thanks. My name's Doug Banfeller, I live in Phoenix. I'm not a medical professional, uh, a patient even, or a doctor. I'm just an advocate. I actually um, have become a very strong advocate for patient rights. To us, it's very, very important that patients have access to what works for them. The good old country doctor used to say, well, I'm sorry, the best good old country doctors used to be those who listened to their patients. And I'm afraid that in modern times, uh, pharmaceutical companies have had a great deal of sway, and doctors are more likely to quickly prescribe something rather than actually listen to their patients as we listen to patients here today and really think about what they're hearing and then try to apply the best uh, solution or treatment for their conditions. Uh, the 800 pound gorilla we have in the room really is NIDA, National Institute on Drug Abuse. Because as we know, and we've heard some testimony about, uh, peer-reviewed research is very hard to come by in the US. Other countries have been doing it. Other countries have seen advances in the understanding of cannabis and how it works. Uh, in the US, that's been very difficult. But I would like to say as Director Humble, our organization, our, our petition that we submitted, we did make every good faith effort, as I'm sure the other, uh, for the other conditions those folks have too, to find the peer-reviewed research that is required. And we certainly don't fault you for that. We'd like to say thank you. I think uh, most of us in this community applaud you all for your efforts to put together a tightly regulated program that works. We've all had a lot of obstacles. You've had your obstacles, of course. Uh, but uh, my particular bane is, is NIDA. And as you know, Dr. Sue Sisley, who couldn't be here today, regretfully she didn't plan on making it. Uh, she has an FDA-approved study for PTSD combat veterans using a, a cannabis as a treatment. And so far, NIDA has refused to provide cannabis for that study, even though the FDA has approved it. And so that's kind of the incoherence of our national drug policy. Uh, I'll get off that soapbox now. I just want to thank you for the opportunity to support uh, us in our efforts to uh, bring uh, a medicine that works, a natural, non-toxic, herbal medicine that seems to work for a lot of people and has for about 5,000 years. Uh, and Say that I think it's probably the best way we can honor our veterans as well as uh, the everyday Arizonans that we have who have life trauma of various sorts and find that this medication works for them. Thank you. Good job, Doug. Yeah. Right on. Uh, next up is Cleveland uh, Fairbanks. I'm uh, Leland Fairbanks, MD, a uh, family physician for, oh, been here 54 years ago as a family physician in the state and a licensed physician. And I am one of those doctors who does listen to my patients. And that's the reason why I respect the total picture here of listening and then learning what all we can do that total comprehensive program should involve the medical community, the social community, the family community, and the faith community. And we don't have those working together, and that's the reason why we, we struggle with many of our problems. But anyway, as a family physician, I have also served 30 years with the Department of Family and Community Medicine, University of Arizona faculty, and some other, I've been on some other medical school faculties as well during my time as a 30-year U.S. Public Health Service Commissioned Officer Physician. And I learned to uh, work a lot with the FDA. We had a lot of relationships for their annual meetings. I have great confidence in them. I trust them. They are struggling to come up with the right answers. 
and they have to look at both the benefits and the claim the benefits and the miracle benefits claimed and then the realities and so it's the safety on the road when you're driving safety with equipment safety with the family safety when you're handling a gun safety issues versus what are the real issues and so on that basis i'm representing arizona's concerned about smoking i'm the person the president of that organization we have the executive director here uh, of the arizona addiction treatment program uh, david gallagher and he's had a lot of experience with some of the, the other side of the tragedies of what the young people are getting into when they're using marijuana. And then they're going out and getting marijuana cards to keep on using when they've already got into tragedies from the use in the first place. Um, I would like to say then that on behalf of some of the other medical organizations who are not here, I've done a survey and have gotten opinions and medical uh, statements from others and I've talked to the hospital and so on. So that on behalf of the Arizona, Arizona's Concerned About Smoking, the Arizona Addiction Treatment Program, and drug abuse counselors that I work with, and uh, the church community, the faith community, the medical community, I do not recommend, and I don't believe that we can recommend adding anything more to the conditions that are now on the list. And in fact, some of those on the list are dubious whether they should be in there and they're being abused now. So to add more, and I stand the FDA as an honorable, is the organization that's been entrusted and asked to look into the, the issues of whether the drugs are safe, efficacious, so I trust their, their uh, judgment on that. Now some of the organizations that I have uh, talked with over the years on this, uh, well, we're talking about post-traumatic stress disorder, generalized anxiety, depression, migraines, and all the other conditions we already have on there. The Arizona Pharmacy Alliance says there's no standardization of the dosage on this, so they will not allow any pharmacist in Arizona who's going to be licensed to deal with the medical marijuana that we're now uh, having as a part of our law. So the Arizona Pharmacy Alliance does not recommend even dealing with present conditions as legitimate medicine. So they do not approve adding. The Arizona Osteopathic Medical Association, their 679 physician organization, they do not recommend adding. The Navajo Area Indian Health Service and the Indian programs do not recommend adding. And I don't believe that the reservations are having anything to do with the dispensaries. Yeah, I, uh, this is my understanding. Uh, then uh, the Phoenix Veterans Administration Hospital, I've been there several times, and they tell me we don't want anything to do with this medical marijuana program in our state. And I go back, I went back last week and they said, why are you coming back? Uh, we've already told you what our, our stand is. Uh, we, we simply want nothing to do with it. The uh, editorial uh, columnist for the Arizona Family Physician Magazine. Andrew Carroll uh, is uh, one who's endorsed what I'm saying. And then every hospital I've been to has said they don't want people using uh, an illegal drug. Dr. Yes, five minutes is up. So thank you. If you have additional information, please submit it online if you're not already, as well as uh, comment box outside the door. Yes, and I have <coughs> FDA statement they do not recognize of marijuana in smoke form for any medical diagnostic Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Next up, uh, Michael Flynn. I was uh, diagnosed with depression and anxiety in 1996. I've been medicated for depression since that time. Post-traumatic stress disorder in 2002. By um, a therapist that specialized in disorders. Um, the the worst I think symptoms of, of my condition, uh, other than the, the depression and the anxiety, um, 
are the sort of the reliving of the experience. And when that happens, um, which is um, usually infrequently, but when it does happen, it can cause me to lose a lot of sleep. I've been up for seven, eight days at a time as a result of these um, episodes. The medication that I take um, does provide some relief, minimal amount of relief from the, um, from the depression, but the side effects of it, um, I've tolerated them, but I'd rather not tolerate them any further uh, than I have to. Uh, they're almost sometimes as bad as the, the condition itself. Um, <clears throat> found success um, treating myself with marijuana in the past. It um, elevates my mood and it helped me fall asleep and stay asleep. It doesn't have the side effects that the, uh, the pills that I've been taking for about 16 years have. safer. I think I should have the right to choose the medicine that works for me. Um, it goes to work immediately. You don't have to wait six weeks for it to titrate in your blood. There's no risk of overdose. There's no risk of toxicity. And when you stop, there is no more uh, discomfort or withdrawal symptoms than you get from, if there's no more, it's no less more discomfort, uncomfortable than have, having a cold. And I have, um, I beat addictions to uh, tobacco and methamphetamines and cocaine. So I know what withdrawal symptoms are. And marijuana, I use it every day for several years at one point in my life. Um, I thought I was using it recreationally. Now I believe it was probably to self-medicate. It's, it's effective medicine for me, and uh, maybe, not, maybe not for everyone, but it, it should be recognized as a medicine for this, this condition. So, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Wayne South, his name. If anyone else wants to speak, um, please go to, go to the speaker forum at this time. Hi, my name is Wayne South. Real briefly, I um, developed PTSD. I was in the Marine Corps from 1991 to 94. All the boys in my family served, so when they declared uh, the little mini war in Iraq, the first global experiment, I like to call it, I ran right to the Marine Corps. And um, recently they relaxed the, the rules surrounding PTSD for non-combat vets because um, I was in boot camp and one day the drill instructors came out and they said, well, we just declared war, go back to school. And uh, so raised the, the level of training for deployment, and uh, I got hurt in combat training. And, uh, like a good Marine, I made sure to take as much Motrin as I could get from the, low, uh, the, the base uh, medical clinic and uh, smooth over my pain and keep training for about three years. My knees gave out, my back gave out. Um, finally, it started to affect my head. Um, chain of command didn't like me become, well, going from a really great Marine to a really lackluster Marine and not performer, so I actually had to go to medical. And, uh, you know, it reflected in reviews and treatment and what have you, and politics of it all. Um, and I love the Marine Corps to this day. Skip forward to 1994 and I get out of the Marine Corps, and uh, uh, I graduated top 5th percentile in my class. I hadn't seen 1% of my potential. Um, I had a full boat ride scholarship to the University of Massachusetts College of Engineering. I went to the Marine Corps. Well, it was my family served. What was I? And uh, so I did that, because that's what you're supposed to do. And uh, so my father wanted to repay the debt to society. We're immigrant from Jamaica 45 years ago. He comes here and he says, well, since I made so much money in this country, I did so well for my family, better than I thought I might do for them in Jamaica, I'm going to make all my boys here. So you know, he feared that some might not come back, but he sent us anyways. And I came back with a switch flip in my head, trained to deploy, nothing to do. 
So I started seeking out a lot of problems, uh, acting them out, and I didn't know I was PTSD or hypersensitive, some people call it. I'm watching everything. Yeah, stop that paper. I, I'm, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, and um, all things being equal, three months ago, like four months ago, I, I started using marijuana to medicate, and I got off of the uh, anti-anxiety medications and the antidepressants. At one point over the last uh, 18 years, I became suicidal on the antidepressants. <laughs> They're not as happy as marijuana. Um, all things, like I said, being equal may not be the choice for everybody, but uh, I developed a thyroid condition because of the medicines that I was receiving from the VA, the antipsychotics, the spiritone. I'm not bad mouthing the company, it was the med. Uh, I developed a thyroid condition. I was look healthy, but it's not happening inside, and uh, it's because I'm developing also a tolerance, which the doctors are telling me, no matter what dose we give you, you're going to develop a tolerance, and it's going to stop working one day, and we're going to have to up your dose. Well, see, the problem with my transition period is when I'm not heavily medicated on this stuff is not no dose, it will put you out, and you can't have a conversation, you can't be entertaining, you can't be the class clown anymore, you're just an angry guy if you're not on him. And when I'm off the meds, I go to jail. I fight the cops. Scottsdale, Phoenix, Tempe, five at a time. I'm a jarhead marine, and I shut off. And I get upset, I get <coughs> irritated, and agitated. And I think the guy coughing is making fun of me. But I'm on marijuana now. And guess what? Uh, for the last four months, I haven't had an incident. My girlfriend comes and takes me back, and everything's great. And I'm actually socializing. And it's awful, I know, because there's got to be some kind of collegiate fight going on, like Penn State football against Yale. Penn State doctors against the other. They don't want to share. And we don't know what we came up with since Ronald Reagan era when we've been studying marijuana. Nobody knows what happens in studies. We can't share information and compile some scientific method methodology and just accomplish a very simple goal to prove a simple point. It's very obvious to me. I don't go to jail anymore. My mother is 70 and she doesn't have to worry about her son. Maybe I might actually go to that college. Holy moly, I'm not even religious. Holy moly. But you know, there's a side of me that was designed to fall nations and take them, their societies, and reduce them to rubble, and I'm a jarhead marine. So if I stop smoking the marijuana and I don't pick up the uh, anti anxieties, you know, I'm a story in the news that might not make it because it's not good in a time of war to kill any marines with the cops. Because my daughter's father doesn't want to die. I smoke marijuana illegally. Not because I'm drinking. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, next up is Alex Romero. Thank you. My name is Alex Romero, retired Arizona State University. I'm vice president of Arizona is concerned about smoking founder of Arizona's for Drug-Free Youth and Communities, and I'm a board member of Drug Watch International. Just a little bit about history. In the early 80s, Playboy magazine funded Normal, and their first task was to develop a Trojan horse and to use medical marijuana and the past compassion aspect of it to legalize marijuana, and that was only the start. They were gonna go on for their, from there to legalize all the illicit drugs, and it seems to have been working. That was the early 80s. Here we are in 2012, and you can see, look around, what's going on right now. They've been successful. But let me remind you that this is reminiscent of the rush to medicalize marijuana, or reminiscent of the Fuhrer or related trail in the late 1970s. That was a concoction of, of crushed apricot pits with cyanide that was touted as a miracle cancer cure over 25 years ago. More than half the states legalized its use and judges responded to appeals to frantic cancer patients to make Laetrile available to them. That was an example of unproven medicine being put in the court of public opinion, much as medical marijuana, and the rush to judgment and the response to anecdotal evidence, and the result was that half the states legalized its use. In 1980, the National Cancer Institute and the FDA worked out a protocol to test Laetrile, even though there was no evidence that it had no medical value. One of the doctors involved, Dr. Charles Mortel of the Mayo Clinic said, we have assumed portions that no other quack medicine has assumed before. It would appear that history has repeated itself with the medicalization of crude smoked marijuana, circumventing the gold standard 
for FDA approval of all <coughs> medicine. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Romero. Uh, Tammy. I wasn't going to speak about PTSD because I wasn't treated for it, but I know I've been treated for a lot. Um, I'm t retired Air Force, 23 years of service. I've been retired now for two years. I had two VA doctors tell me that um, I don't need to come back, for, um, a psychiatrist and uh, my GI doctor, and, um, unless my symptoms come back since I became a medical marijuana patient. Um, what I wanted to say about PTSD, though, is the result that can happen if you're not treated right for PTSD. My husband, my ex-husband, uh, when he found out that he was deploying for Afghanistan, all of a sudden couldn't trust me anymore and punched me in the face in an argument. Um, I went through... a um, a whole bunch of depression and, 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 and stress <laughs> over that, but I, was, I, I also have my name on for that, so I, I just wanted to show what PTSD, if you don't get treated properly, this is what can happen. I have a, I can provide x-rays, um, I'll send them online, I, I have x-rays and doctor's documentation proving what had happened, what's happened to my face. Um, I can even pry, uh, provide criminal investigation on my uh, ex-husband, too. Thank you. Um, at this time, uh, we're going to take a break until 2.30. Uh, um, we're someone else wants to fill out a, a student form for PTSD. And when we come back at 2.30, we can discuss uh, migraines, depression, and general anxiety disorder. Can I add two things? Hi, Doug Van Felder again. I just wanted to address a couple of things. Uh, one of Dr. Fairbanks' concerns or comments was about the Pharmacy Association in Arizona uh, not, can be not uh, supporting medical marijuana, particularly smoke, and we understand that. But I did want to say that in the Northeast or in the U.S. right now, uh, those states that are considering adopting a program, Connecticut being one, it's uh, going to land on the <laughs> governor's desk very soon. And thank you, yes, uh, their legislature, and the governor's going to sign it. They, they call for pharmacists to do the dispensing. And the state of New York, they're calling for hospitals and doctors, I'm sorry, pharmacies to do dispensing of cannabis. So there is a great deal of interest, not this condemnation that we're hearing, for cannabis in the medical community. Uh, and the other point I want to make about that, uh, Mr. Romero made a comment about Mayo. A couple of months ago in the Mayo clinical proceedings, uh, Dr. J. Michael Bostwick, Bostwick or Bostwick, I think it's Bostwick, uh, did an article uh, in the May, Mayo clinical proceedings whereby he called it, the title was Blurred, Blurred Boundaries. And he reviewed all the literature available, currently modern literature, on cannabis. Uh, and he did discuss uh, recreational use, that was the blurred boundary between recreational use and medical use. Uh, but he came down at the end, there's a 10-minute video, I'd be happy to share it with anybody. Uh, I have a link to it. But in the end, he came down on calling for uh, Controlled Substance Act to be, re for cannabis under the Controlled Substance Act, CSA, to be rescheduled from one to two or three so that it can be researched. So I just want to make the point that the Mayo Clinic, uh, at least one of their doctors, is very interested in continuing uh, cannabis research because he sees this, as he called it, the tremendous therapeutic potential. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, with anything else, you guys, if you have any additional information, please submit it, provide some link, and uh, we'll speak to you at 2.30. Thank you. Thank you.